Yo ho ho, it's a pirate's life for me as we make the beast with three backs and duplicate some dodgy data. We're going to build this Clone Master V2 and do the dirty deed. Right now. Mark fixes stuff. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. You can get an instant quote on a variety of services or browse a library of talented maker's designs, add them to your cart and have them delivered directly to your door. Commodore 64 software was tricky to copy if you were a playground pirate back in the 80s. Enter the Clone Master V2 by C64 Istanbul. This three-way splitter for Commodore datasets allows one master to pipe data to two recording decks. It's a really simple build with a Schmidt triggered hex inverter, a 220 microfarad capacitor, an LED, a 680 ohm resistor, and some header pins. All in all, not a lot to do, so we can be up and running fast. To connect the copy master to the C64, we'll need to solder on this 6.2 card edge connector, easily found on eBay. First, let's clean down the board with IPA and a soft cloth. Shiny pirate treasure. With the board in the PCB holder, the first thing we'll solder is the 74HC14N logic. I tested this chip in my EEPROM programmer and it's fine, so I'll solder it straight into the board. The gummy crew look on as I sploosh some flux upon the pins. The solder takes really well to this board. I actually bought some Kester solder after so many viewers told me what a great product it was. I also increased my tip temperature to 340 degrees and I think the 10 degree bump in temperature has really helped the soldering here. Thanks for the feedback. Next up, the 680 ohm resistor. And again, soldering is a breeze. I need to invest in some new snips next, I think. The board requires this 220 microfarad capacitor. I'm going to use this Panasonic 16 volt part. The long leg is the positive anode side and goes into the hole with the plus on the board. Once the capacitor is soldered in, we trim the leaves with our flash side cutters. Although the bill of materials says a red LED, I'll use this blue one that I have to hand. Again, the long positive anode leg goes into the side marked with a plus. Don't take too long soldering LEDs or they can melt. Slow motion action time. Always use protection, I mean, for your eyes. Next up is the mystery header block. I do need to look up what this does. A bit of ye olde smurf poop. And then pull off the blue poo. Gummy Terry and Gummy Dave have kindly brought me the connector. Cheers chaps. Using a flat surface I push down and bend the pins in to roughly meet each other in the middle. Once they're bent, we can slide the PCB in between them and fix them with plenty of solder. More flux is required, of course. And then I use loads of solder on the two endmost pins. Once those pins are solid, I can use this opportunity to make sure the connector is nice and straight before doing the rest of the pins. The 
the second side is the same, big blobs of strong solder required. These kinds of connections actually end up being really very strong. And the final pin is soldered. This really is an easy build. Let's check our work, then we can try it out. Looks good, I'll clean this flux off later. Dave is taking this whole piracy thing a bit too seriously I think, but let's try out our naughty device. Data set one for the master copy playback. Data set two for our first copying deck. And data set three for our second recording device. And this is where it all went wrong. In my eagerness, I left this jumper on these header pins, but they're not headers, and are for adding additional power to the board and recording without a C64 at all. So you're actually witnessing me about to kill my C64. I confidently put Mike Reed's pop quiz into the master deck. In the second deck, I loaded a blank C15 cassette. And the same in the third deck. Note that I'm being gentle so I don't jog the camera on the bench. Then, like a pirating fool, I put in the power. The C64 comes on, so I think it's all fine. But I didn't RTFM, so I didn't realise that the rogue jumper was shorting everything out. As I set the decks to record and play, I became increasingly confused as to why nothing would work. I even tried turning it off and on again. At this point, many of you are screaming at the screen. Yes, I blew the 9 volt fuse in the machine. And I'm a very, very naughty pirate. So yeah, don't do that. Upon looking at the instructions, I quickly removed the jumper and replaced the fuse. Whoops, but no harm done. With that problem solved, the MFS Pirate Factory swung into full... um, swing. Although Dataset 2 decided it no longer wanted to play anymore. Maybe it has a conscience. I'm loading the game as it copies, although that's not required, it just looks more interesting on camera. I hope you're enjoying this video about my swashbuckling and fairly pointless retro adventure. If you'd like to help me make more, perhaps you'd consider chucking some change into the hat at patreon.com forward slash stuff. Patrons get ad-free early access and behind the scenes exclusive videos. You'll also get your name up in lights in the Patreon credits. With this classic game loaded, I tested it out for a round before trying our hot bootleg goods. I do love my willy. Then came the time to test, the moment of truth. Could we load the counterfeit cassette? And all indications were good. The game loaded fine, as did the question block that loaded in after the initial game engine. Well, this was a really fun build. You can order your own board from C64 Istanbul's link below. Did anyone have anything like this back in the 80s? Let me know your experiences below. I want to say a massive thanks to my Patreon supporters here on the screen. Mark Fix's stuff is driven by them and I wouldn't be able to make these videos without them. If you fancy becoming a supporter, pop along to patreon.com forward slash stuff. Thank you all so much. And thanks for watching this video. Here's a couple of others I've made. Let me know what you think of them. 
Bye.